Yep, let's start. So, welcome everybody to this talk called Time Traveling Bugs, how a two decade old issue still haunts software scalability. Very long title. We used large language model to generate this title so that we are compliant and we are also speaking about AI. No, I'm just kidding. Like the DeLorean. And um, so, myself, my name is Luca Molteni. I work as a software engineer for Red Hat, and I'm presenting alongside with my friend Francesco here, which is also a performance engineer at Red Hat. He's much better than me. You realize that, uh, you realize that in a second. No pressure. no pressure. Yeah, it's much better. So our journey starts here from rule engines. Are you familiar with the concept of rule engines? Do you know what a rule engine is? How many of you know what a rule engine is? One. So it's not important today, right? So ju it's just the beginning of a story, right? You just have to think about a rule engine as a new kind, a new style of programming, which is declarative instead of procedural. And there is this execution which uses this internal data structure called RITI. We won't get into details. We will say that um, this data structure is designed to be fast, extremely fast. That's the idea of rule engine. It's a system where everybody can define their own rule their custom logic and you can edit and modify it like frequently and easily and uh, the execution of this data structure should be fast or at least in some specific cases so um, this rule engine called Druze is the one I'm working on I've been working on this for six years and uh, it was written with a very deep object-oriented programming flavor. So let's imagine that the initial algorithm was called RITOO, which stands for object-oriented. So you have to imagine like having many different classes, many types, many interfaces. And you see that uh, the fact that we had many types were actually a problem for them. So this name, check it out if you're interested in Rule Engine. And today we're also talking about OptiPlanner, eh? which is another project I've been working on. And um, so OptoPlanner is built on top of Druze, and it solves a particular set of uh, problems which are called the optimization problems, which are the problems that cannot be solved easily by normal algorithms. So it uses heuristics to generate different solutions to a problem. Typical problem of OptoPlanner might be, let's organize a conference, a single truck conference. So you give uh, some sets of constraints, like uh, you cannot have two talks at the same time, or maybe somebody has to talk uh, in the morning because in the afternoon there is an airplane, and OptoPlanner just solves it for you. Um, what happens is that you make OptoPlanner works for quite a long time, whatever you want, and um, the faster you go, the, the, um, the more time OptoPlanner works, the better the solution is, right? So how OptoPlanner relates to Druze? Because OptoPlanner, to verify that the solution is correct, the solution generated by the heuristics, uses Druze. So for each constraint, OptoPlanner will generate a rule of Druze, and we will build this data structure we talked before, the RITI. So by using the RITI with a constraint and then putting the solution provided by the heuristics, it will tell you if the solution is wrong or correct. If it's wrong, it discards it. If it's correct, it goes forward. So why is that important? Because the faster the rules is at evaluating those heuristics, the better it is. And we assume we knew that the rules was fast, right? We knew and we assumed that it was fast enough. But truth is, it wasn't fast enough. So what happened is that uh, the OptoPlanet team created a different uh, constraint evaluation engine, score evaluation engine, which uh, was faster than the and <laughs> to be fair, I was kind of annoyed by this fact, right? Because I wanted Druze to be the faster. So I decided to devote some of my time to get Druze faster. And uh, guess what? I managed to get it a bit faster. So we'll get into this later anyway. So how should I start? I had no previous experience in performance engineering. I didn't know how to do that. I mean, I have something like 15, 16 years experience in this world, but nobody came to me and say, here's a piece of code, make it faster. It's quite, quite scary, right? But um, luckily, my friend Francesco knew how to do this job, and uh, he helped me quite a lot. So the fact is that you shouldn't be scared. I mean, I was scared as well, so it's totally comprehensible. Anyway, you shouldn't be, because sometimes there are very... This, this kind of problem we call low-hanging fruits, which are kind of simple, even though they're quite hard to understand maybe, but they're simple to execute to get your, your code faster. 
But it's important for you that if you want to start with performance programming, if you want to start to get your code faster, you have to start from precise expectations. You cannot just take a piece of code and say, let's make this 1,000 times faster. It doesn't work like that. You have to have a general idea on how fast your code is, how fast you want your code to be, and then how, how to get there, right? And how to do that? You measure. If you don't measure, you cannot work. You cannot improve uh, your code. The only way to make sure that you're actually improving your code is to have some kind of measurement. So to have some kind of benchmark, you make an optimization, and your code goes faster, and you see it in the benchmark, right? Luckily, we, um, in OptoPlanet, we had already a benchmark because the OptoPlanet team had created a benchmark. We knew how much faster could it be because we knew that the new score calculation engine was four times faster. So we had the baseline, which was Drews, and we had the comparison. We were like in the perfect scenario. So perfect scenario, but of course, I didn't have that much of experience. So I went to Francesco's house, and we started like making profiling. We used um, all kind of profiler, I think profile, but we, don't, we won't talk about profiler today. I just wanted to tell you that this interesting stuff, profilers were broken, and we didn't know why. Okay, there was this specific thing, we had broken frames later, we're going to go into details. Anyway, it was broken. And um, we didn't know, we wanted to explore why. And at the same time, uh, Francesco proposed me to, do, to, to try to run the benchmarks on a much faster machine. You see, at the time, I just had a laptop, which is very slow, just four cores. And Francesco, on the other hand, like, uh, had like the most powerful machine in all Milan. It's probably, I don't know how many cores. It's the company is paying for his machine, by the way, obviously. Anyway, he decided, like, let's use, let's run Drew's uh, Optoplanet's benchmark on a different machine, which is much faster. And you can see the, um, the code. Let's use this. So the code wasn't scaling linearly as much as we were expecting, right? If you uh, increase the amount of thread, the code was scaling logarithmically. And that is not good. You want to make sure that if you add CPUs, your code goes faster, okay? It doesn't go slower, relatively. So Francesco told me, you know, um, last year working on a problem was two symptoms were to have broken frames and not to scale properly. Guess what? Ha ha ha. Drew software of the, um, drew software from this problem, which uh, we call, no, who called? I'm not sure who called, anyway, who gave this name. It's, it's not a particularly interesting name. It's called secondary super cache problem, but it's simple, it's effective, and it works, and it's easy to remember. Before going to the details of, um, of, the, um, of the problem, let's talk about whether this is a problem for your code or not, okay? So, probably yes, because it's a bug that has been here for 20 years, but uh, it's especially a problem if your code is what we define CPU bound. So in my journey of performance engineering, I discovered that performance works with bottlenecks. So you have a series of bottlenecks, and each bottleneck hides the next bottleneck. So the, the most obvious bottleneck you might think of that slows your application down is network. If your, CPU, if your application is network bound because it goes on the internet, it will probably be slow. So Probably this problem is not just for you. But if your application, you already know that it's as fast as possible because it uses um, less, uh, less I.O. than possible. And you have no problem with I.O., physical I.O. You have no problem with hard disks or SSDs. And uh, the only problem that you have, and you already know, is CPU, so it's CPU bound, then, and of course, you're running on a JVM, because, because I didn't tell you, but this is a problem for the JVM. Um, this is a problem for you. Okay, especially when you need to scale over multiple processor, and especially if you're running multiple applications on the same JVM. I know that it's not typical to run multiple applications on a JVM. These days, it's all about Kubernetes and pods and stuff like that. So most pods are just running one single instance of a JVM, but I'm pretty sure that there is somebody still. Is there somebody working, like deploying multiple applications on the same JVM here? No? Don't be shy. Yeah, two, at least two. This problem is for you. Three, yeah. So, good idea. Anyway, what's this secondary super cache? So, secondary super cache is a terminology taken from the, the actual code of the JVM. So, we're a Java developer. I mean, I am a Java developer. And uh, we 
don't take a look much at the JVM internal code. And that's a pity because it's actually quite clear to understand. And the, if you have a problem with performance, the solution is mo most probably inside the JVM itself. Anyway, we have this file, which is called class with a K, using the same convention that is typical in, JV in, in Java as well to call the class, and represent a Java class, okay? That has two fields. And let's start with the second first, which is called secondary supers. So secondary supers is the JVM terminology for interfaces. As you might know, in Java, you have ty data types, you have um, concrete classes, interfaces, abstract classes. A concrete class can implement multiple interfaces, that's the key, multiple, I say many interfaces, and just one abstract class or um, concrete class as a super type, okay? So the secondary super is an array of pointers, is an array of reference of all the in interfaces implemented by your type. And uh, the first field, on the other hand, is a secondary super cache, is a single value cache of the last observed secondary super type. Here's the key. So the problem appears when um, the JVM checks, does a type check, so, so check whether your type implements an interface or not. It will go throughout the second field, throughout the array of all implemented interfaces, and it will store in a single cache value the last observed. So let's see now. Now let's talk about why they decided to do this, okay? So they decided to do this in 2002, so a very long time ago, and it was actually a good, proper good idea. I mean, I think that the original inventor didn't think about what could happen in the next 20 years. In 2002, it was very different from today. For example, I wasn't programming, for example. I was very young. And um, <laughs> so uh, the original creator, creators, in this case, I think it's John Rose, right? Uh, of these, uh, this implementation, we're thinking about Java types of having many implemented interfaces. So they wanted to have some way of speed up. Of course, if you want to check whether a type implements an interface or not, you have to go throughout all the array, right? So the complexity is O of N of the complexity of the, of the length of the array. So if you have just a cache of single value, then perhaps it's faster. But these days we have multiple processor, we have parallelism, and now it has become a problem. And the problem is still in most implementation of a JVM. Um, so why is that a problem? Because this cache is unstable. Unstable means that it gets rewritten a lot. And this is not a behavior that you want for a cache. You want a cache to be stable, you want cache to be populated, and then you use the cache instead of doing the actual operation. If you get a cache that it get constantly modified, then it's a problem. And we see also some details of problem. And it's especially a problem if you have, because class is a singleton for a given type. So if you have multiple processors using, for example, in integer, they will all share the same cache. Think about it. Think about using in a heavily concurrent code with multiple threads and stuff like that. And, uh, so let me show you an animation stolen from another presentation of this very topic. So um, this is a method in Java that will check whether the data type in input implements two interfaces, different, comparable and serializable. Comparable to compare stuff, serializable to serialize stuff, ob obviously. And on the um, top right, you have the field of a cache. So first is none, enter, for example, an integer, checks whether integer is a comparable, that's true. You populate the cache with comparable, right? Remember, the last seen interface of a type check. So it goes inside the body, use comparable, it cast. Cast is another type check. So this will use the cache, will read the cache comparable, will cast comparable. This is the cache working. So it's actually good code, right? But at line five, it will check again if it's an instance of serializable. So what it will do? It will check the, the field first. We'll see that the serializable is different than comparable. It will invalidate the cache. It will store serializable inside it. And then it will use the cache to do the casting. As you can see, in just five lines of code, it already invalidated the cache. The cache is very unstable. So did Rose have this kind of problem? Obviously, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Anyway, um, as you can see, here is the type hierarchy. Uh, this is a tool used by the idea. It's very useful. And you can see so many different types. And uh, Drews has a really complicated type hierarchy. And inside of code of Drews, we abused of instance of. We use the instance of a lot. We might discuss whether using instance of or not is quite a good thing or is object-oriented programming. Anyway, we did that. Probably not the best design, right? 
And for, uh, also we had some hidden checks, so definitely those had this problem. We already knew it, right? Because we tested, we measured it. We had the benchmark and we knew that the benchmark wasn't scaling properly among different threads. So how do we fix the problem? We see it later, there is a, obviously by modifying code, but interesting stuff is that each time you fix a problem of this cache here, the, the problem gets moved to a different type. So it's kind of a, this game, which is, I think it's called whack a mole when you actually hit moles, right? And you fix the problem here, it goes there. It's very satisfying, I suggest you to try it. But the important thing is that you have to use a benchmark taken from a real world. If you're writing a benchmark, it doesn't do anything useful, it's not important for you. You're pretty sure that you have fixed the problem just when you see your benchmark taken from the real world that does the thing that you're expecting to do, in this example, to scale properly, right? If you don't have a benchmark, just write one, but make sure that it resembles somehow the real world. You don't want to be too synthetic, okay? Luckily, we already had it, I already say. Anyway, the agent. So my friend Francesco here wrote an agent, which is a simple Java application that runs on top of our application using the library, this library, which is called ByteBuddy, which is works perfectly, so thank you, Raphael, for having written it. And uh, here's the link, I will share the presentation later. Anyway, if you search on Google or DuckDuckGo, type pollution agent, you will find the agent. I won't get into details, this is not a tutorial for the agent because I find it is quite boring, but I will show you the output of the agent in the case of tools. So, uh, at the beginning you have join, type of course, comment, and then join not left up all you see. Um, that is one type of tools that got checked like three billion times against three different interfaces. This is an execution or something like, I don't know, remember if it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever. So it gets checked for 800 million types for the single interface, 800 million types for the other interface. And of course there are other checks which are hidden. I cropped the, the checks so they don't add up anyway. three billion comparison. And this is three billion times the cache gets invalidated. Imagine the impact it has on the CPUs. That is impressive. So what you do, you take each single case, you see in the report it's very useful because it gives you the, um, the method and the line where actually this type check happens. So you just go there and you try to prevent the type check. So we'll see a few patterns today. These are not the best solution. Probably the first one especially is probably the worst solution. Um, yes. So um, the first one that we're going to see, now you're going to see very bad code, which is I'm not proud of. Anyway, um, let's start with the first. This is before and after, so after my fix. So you can see there is this method called get key, uh, which was in the hot path of truths. This means that it gets called a lot. Okay, as you can see before, you remember the report got called something like eight million, 800 million times. Anyway, exactly what it did, exactly the same thing that I showed you before. It checked for the first interface and then checked for the second interface. Probably not, but not the best um, code, right? I decided to write a solution that is probably even worse from a code perspective, it's very bad code, but at least it doesn't suffer from this problem. So firstly, you want to add a comment. Right? Because otherwise, the next developer that will come and see what happens will say, why have you written such a code? That's the most terrible code. But it actually fixes the problem. So we're going to check, instead of uh, doing an instance of on an interface, we're going to do an instance of of a concrete type or an abstract class. Why? Because doing an abstract class, an instance of an abstract class on a, or a concrete class is very cheap and does not invalidate the cache. Let me repeat this. If you're doing an instance of on a concrete class or an abstract class, it won't invalidate the cache, okay? So it's pretty easy. You check all the concrete class that may pass from here and just put all of them in the instance of, right? Do you like it? No, yeah, we should because this code is fast. <laughs> I mean, it's faster than before. Anyway, the important stuff here is that of course, we should keep the interfaces as last. Does anybody know why we're keeping the interfaces as last? Because I, I, I've done all these presentations say don't do instance of an interfaces, but we're still doing instance of an interfaces. 
Nobody wants to try. I'll tell you why. Because in Java, it might happen that there is a type that you don't know, but it implements that interface. The most typical examples are stubs and mocks using testing, right? If you avoid doing the interfaces as a last step, then it might break during testing. Right? So just add the interface, but just as a last. And make sure that it's not passing through here, right? So mm, 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 mm. I forgot that I had a slide for that. So uh, another solution that uh, this is taken from Hibernate. I'm pretty sure it's a pretty famous library, does database stuff. So Hibernate had the same problem, but at the same time, they knew, the Hibernate developers knew that each entity implemented a single type. So I really know that there was like a super type for every entity. So they decided to add a virtual method to the entity, which is called as entity mapping type, and implement it like differently. If it's an instance of this type, return this. If it's not an instance of this type, it returns null. So in practice, what does that mean? That instead of doing instance of, you call this method and you check whether this is null or not. It works because it's an instance of on an interface without actually doing an instance of. Clever trick. Congratulations, Sam, for having found it. I haven't, <laughs> of course. And this is another way that we fix the problem in drones, um, and it deals with generics. So you might have learned in university or maybe in the books that uh, there is thing that is called type erasure at runtime, and that when you run the code, the generics remove all the type information from the bytecode, but it it's actually not true. In the bytecode, there is still things called guards, which are ifs, and guess what? There are type checks that will check whether your generic collection, for example, um, fits the exact type that you are putting in, right? So instead of doing here, for example, you have an iterator in rules of a tuple, which is an interface. So instead of doing fast iterator on a tuple, which is an interface, we replace it with a fast iterator of an abstract tuple. And guess what? Abstract tuple is not an interface, but rather an abstract class. And again. It's fast, it's uh, exactly the same, but at least it doesn't invalidate the cache, so it doesn't suffer from the problem. And please beware of this, because generics are very tricky. For example, this, this method using this pattern of diamond T, which returns the same type that you give as an input, as typical in the API in Java, and this very simple method introduces, check, this is the bytecode on below, introduces the check cast at, nine, at uh, line 9. So imagine that you're just using this method because you want your API to be as good as you want and you want to, to do a type checking, and instead you get the, your software slower just because you use this generic. It's not good, right? One very last thing, one very last pattern that we use to fix it is just to revise, to revisit your type hierarchies, to revisit your code. So it, ha it probably happened to most of you like to have a single interface, in this case we had tuple, and we had a single implementation of this, this interface. When I started coding, everybody was saying, every time that you write a class, you should write an interface for the class. Why they did that? I mean, they did that because they came from C++ and C, right? When you had header files and uh, implementation files. But in Java, this is not only useless, it's, only, it's also harmful. In this case, it's very harmful. We had like interfaces, an interface that was there for no reason, in this case, uh, tuple, I'm sorry, left tuple, and we replace it with a concrete class in each time. It is even better from the code perspective because it's less code. We remove uh, one interface that was useless, and it's also easier to test because um, when you see an interface, you assume that you want to use some kind of stubs and mocks to pass as a parameter. But sometimes you just have to pass the actual type, right? You call new and you call an actual type. This works. It's a pr probably the best solution because less code is better and it fixes a secondary super cache problem. And uh, of course, when it's possible, do this. So what really happened beneath the surface? Will um, Francesco will tell you about it. Yes, uh, right at the beginning I promised everyone a shit mo a poo moment uh, and that's not a uh, chocolate pudding. Because uh, actually this one is uh, what we are going through for the next slides, for example. Uh, most of the problem uh, of this uh, secondary super cache is not just a software problem. It's something that is straightly related to how our, our uh, hardware works. 
So we are going through that part uh, in the next slide. So let's try to call back, you know, the, the recall the, the previously courses of computer science about uh, hardware. How many people know about CPUs and caches that they exist? That's great. Uh, close the door, please, in case someone run away. But anyway, modern uh, CPUs are slightly different from the one described in 2002 in which they barely have more than one core. Now they are even separated physically, so there, there can be distance. They can be clustered all together. But something that didn't change that much, or partially, is that there still exists an hierarchy of memory in which the last level cache is used like a message bus to communicate across different clusters of cores. Some, something like that didn't change. And now we will go through the real shit moment in which you will re realize how bad this performance prob problem has been because of this kind of design of the CPU. So this is coming, oh, I always talk uh, without that one. Okay, but it's fine. I hope everyone was able to hear me. Okay, fine. So this is coming from uh, Anantec, uh, for example, is a site of, for people that are video game hardcore people, mostly. And uh, this is coming from the kind of CPU that uh, Luca talked about uh, that was a dome to me. So it's a consumer CPU. And it contains about uh, 32 cores. These 32 cores are separated in two clusters. And uh, this is uh, the latency of communication across cores. And uh, in particular, I don't know if there are many colorblind people. I hope not. I will translate it for you. Basically, there are two types of colors here. Because when you cross the bridge and you have to communicate across different clusters, the cost became uh, seven times more. And in this graph uh, is the yellow-orange part. The green part is when you communicate across the same cluster. So communication is not free and is heterogeneous in the modern CPU. So caches doesn't work like in the past. That's important. And then uh, that's another problem, uh, and uh, I will translate it even more in what Luca has explained before. So we talk about uh, these two fields uh, in the left. So the secondary super cache and secondary super. How many people uh, is worried about uh, the classes and instances are laid out in memory in Java? Not many people, actually. So sometimes it happens, but the most of the people doesn't care. I mean, the JVM will do the right thing. In other languages, like in C++, doesn't work actually like that. And uh, for example, these two fields uh, are coming from the OpenJDK source code that is written mostly in C++. And these two, two fields in memory could be laid out uh, one after the other. How it translates? So let's say that uh, you have uh, two different uh, threads each one uh, working on two different sockets, each one working on two different CPUs. And uh, they are separated by the, the memory hierarchy. And uh, we have the memory, the actual memory, in which uh, they need uh, to communicate uh, to each other. Communicate to what? So let's say that uh, the socket zero thread would like to write into the secondary super cache field. It's a single field but the unit uh, of information that is uh, transferred is not a single field because caches work at cache lines and cache line can have uh, 32, 64 bytes that if you wanted to translate it into the number of field is like translating, uh, moving eight field at times. So what happened? Let's say that the socket zero would like to write the secondary super cache. There exists a cache coherency protocol that decides to invalidate uh, the whole cache line in memory in order to make it happen that that single field is going to be updated. And let's say that there is another CPU, the socket one CPU, that would like to check against the secondary supers. That, oh gosh, we have been unlucky. They are all on the same cache line. What happened? The first CPU became a noisy neighbor. So it, they are going to share a cache line, even if uh, apparently when you read the code, uh, you can't see that. 
So there is th this inherent uh, dependency because how the hardware work. And that translated that if you keep on changing one, you slow down the others because the other require to have a uh, fresh up to date uh, old cache line, even if the actual field was uh, barely immutable because in Java, the least uh, transitive interfaces implemented by specific concrete type tend to stay still for the whole duration. And that complicate a lot of troubleshooting this problem because if you try to profile it, you will find uh, problems everywhere even in code that you wouldn't ever blame. And this problem has been pro very problematic because uh, generics exist from year, from years, eon, I would say. And if you use collection, you use generics. If you use lambdas, you use the generics. This code is affecting the whole world in Java. And has been so much important that Netflix uh, uh, wrote a blog post in the same period in which I discovered that problem uh, claiming the same thing, but very interestingly, uh, th they have a lot of machines, uh, and because of uh, you know the central uh, theorem limits, uh, depending how the two fields are laid out in memory, sometimes they can be near, sometimes not, because uh, in a real machine you have a thing called the randomization of addresses for security, and when it happens. Sometimes the two fields are not near. They cross the, the boundaries of that ca cache line. And Netflix say that one on eighth of server were having terrible performance, like one third. So there was kind of confirmation. But uh, they didn't they make the whole homework right, actually. Because uh, they just tried to profile. They didn't find anything and say, okay, profilers are broken. But now, you know, it's the shit iceberg. So let's go deeper. Profiler are broken. Why are broken? How many people knows about uh, flame graphs? Okay, I it's just a way to represent stack traces, let's say. So you have ancestry and on the top, uh, the actual method that has been observed. Now, what's wrong with this one? Because in the left, uh, you can see some method that doesn't have uh, the ancestry thing. That was the actual broken frame. And the actual broken frame were messy. This is the, the kind of broken frame problem that Luca was talking about. Having something like that doesn't help you to know what's going on, you know. So we had to go deeper. And we use another kind of profiler that requires us to read about us. My eyes are as, but actually I, I read about uh, 20k lines of assembly for entire weeks. I was uh, so terribly disgusted. My, my wife say, okay, you, you feel so sorry in this period. It was because of this story, but it's paid off because we found out a single instruction in assembly called uh, Rappen's uh, SCAS, so no, not a good name. But sometimes you, you got to be lucky in your life. So I spent a lot of time. It was a single instruction that if you search in the OpenJDK source code, that there is a single line in the whole JDK code to find it. And we found th the actual reason. But let's move forward about the broken stack trace. So I, I love open source. I work for that. So I always nag people to work for me, even if they are not paid for that. In this case, I reach out to the guy that wrote the profiler, that was a scene profiler, and I show up another profiler that wasn't broken in order to create a competition. I hope this guy is not going to watch this talk, but anyway, uh, I show another profiler that wasn't broken. And uh, as work, nagging the people. So in this case, uh, he trans is definitely a very good JDK developer as well. And he told me that in the assembly, which actually performed the type check, uh, there is a, 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 a thing that break the whole assumption of how profiling work in Java. Because profiling work by asking, actually, to the JDK, please give me the stack trace, kind of. But uh, the, the assumption is that the frame in which is construct, the call stack, are always a fixed and known size from the JDK perspective. But uh, in that code uh, was present an assembly extraction called the push that modified the stack 
pointer and modify the, the, the sides of the frame. And in that case, uh, it breaks every single profiler. So it was a great win to find this problem because uh, right after we find it, uh, we get you know, feedback from the JDK people in order to actually fix the problem for any profiler. So now you can detect it, that the problem is there. The only problem is that uh, it doesn't represent a line of code of your code. So you will see that a specific method is problematic, but you don't know exactly in which line of code. So this is not going to replace the usage of the agent. That instead give you the line of code. And that is actually the demonstration if you search for uh, NPA in uh, scan. So we haven't been brave or good. Uh, we have been, you know, a good lucky sometimes so that helps and if you are really curious uh, about uh, what the fuck uh, what it is uh, that uh, instruction uh, if you search in the intel uh, uh, developer manual uh, you know they are cisc cpu it's incredible they have a linear search among a string in a single instruction it's incredible no and you know j just for curiosity but Let's recap all the stuff we have looked at it, because uh, th th this seems very random, but they are not actually. We talk about uh, a true sharing problem. The true sharing comes from that single field that is actually shared. And that already creates a scalability problem, because as we said, you require the last level cache to be used as a message bus, uh, bus to communicate across CPUs. If e each CPU try to modify it, they fight for the same cache line. We have, in addition, a false sharing problem that makes interpretation of profiling data very bad and uh, create a noisy everywhere. And not just noisy, the performance sucks because even if you search uh, against the interface, you get a performance hit. This problem was so bad that even the, the people that wrote that line of code that decide to fill uh, a, a JDK issue two years later, say, okay, no one is going to use multi-cores, it's not the future, actually. But it didn't work like that. And uh, what happened is just John Rose, that is a JVM architect, architect uh, filled that specific issue. And we opened the Pandora's box. So actually, these are the list uh, of uh, application, framework, library I can talk about. But uh, the list uh, is way longer. So Netty moved uh, basically internet in Java everywhere. It was severely affected. We are talking about Hibernate as well. The new version of Hibernate uh, that in theory should be bound because it talked to a database, get a twice improvement. It's huge for a project that exists from long time. So it's pretty bad. But uh, because of all these noises, because of this conference, because of all the other conference, blog posts, whatever, has become a moving target. So now the JDK people has prioritized it, finally. And uh, this one is a PR coming from uh, Roland, uh, that is one of the guys that worked for Red Hat, in which uh, he fixed uh, a reproducer that he gave him, uh, we gave him. So things are getting better. And there is even in place uh, a, a workaround this work around so things kind of are being to be fixed let's say kind of because uh, uh, you know i love to go deeper so it's not just the title the title say thread the local back off for secondary super cache updates now we can kind of understand how it works it's a back off it means that regardless who is going to perform the invalidation of the cache if is in the same thread, if you exhaust the number of times you are supposed to do it, you just don't do it. So at a certain point, if someone stopped to perform the cache invalidation. That's very bad because if you have a library that has not been fixed with do it the thing right, the old performance will still have problem. You don't have a scalability problem, but uh, you don't go anymore in the fast path. The fast path was that cache sometimes work. That's the problem. So it disable for the old thread the cache. That's why it's a workaround. It's not a solution. Please. The, 
this is lacking. Uh, we ah, yes, sir, the coin change. No, no, no. I if uh, we add dislikes uh, to GitHub, uh, that would be a lot of fun for me. <laughs> Considering the kind of changes that we had to perform for this kind of problem, I, w I will have people, you know, that try to kill me probably at home. Uh, that's my wife already, but that's a separate problem. So, in conclusion. So, uh, um, yep. So, conclusion was now is now Drews faster as the other NG for Auto Planner? No, it's not. But it's faster, it's faster than before. And uh, these fixes are already in the latest final version of Drews. So, if you use Drews at home and you've upgraded to the latest final, you will see that you'll have far better scalability. It was the performance was so better that we decided to backport it for Drew 7, which is actually kind of old release. But um, so, uh, so it was a big win. So I suggest you to use the agent. Uh, You'll find an instruction on GitHub and see if your problems, if your system is affected, if your software is affected by this problem. And um, write a few benchmarks, do some kind of simulation. And if you're interested in the same problem, there is uh, another presentation on YouTube done at DevOx, um, which talk about Quarkus, which is another library made by open source library made by Red Hat and among others. Yes, and uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Questions, we have three minutes. No? So everything was clear. So let me ask you a question if you're too shy to ask questions to Zash. So will you use the agent? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was searching for. Okay, so if there are no questions, I think that's it. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>